Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Ware. I am the Associate State Director of Advocacy and Outreach for AARP in Cincinnati, Ohio. I lead the advocacy and community engagement efforts here in the greater Cincinnati and Southwest Ohio area. And on behalf of AARP, I bring you greetings from across the nation. It's always fun to see where people are joining us. And I see we have some people from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Tallahassee, Florida, all the way from Sacramento. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to walk you through how to engage with us. Many of you have already figured that out, that if uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A, we will have a question and answer portion of the event toward the uh, end of it. You don't have to wait until the end of the event to put your questions in there. You can start to populate the Q&A uh, chat now, and we'll go through those questions as many as we can toward the end of the event. Also, after today's session, you will receive an email asking you to let us know about your experience, um, along with an opportunity to provide your address in order to receive a free copy of the Family Tree Toolkit, a comprehensive guide to uncovering your ancestry and researching genealogy by our moderator, Kenyatta D. Berry, while supplies last. And you'll also receive additional genealogy tips and resources. So again, you'll get that email at the end of this event. We'd love it if you tell us about your experience by answering our survey and giving us your address. You can get a free copy of those resources. Before we begin, we recognize the likelihood that many of you joining today are or will be the family caregivers for your parent, spouse, sibling, or loved one. So I wanna take a few minutes to share some resources that could help you care for your loved ones. There are 48 million family caregivers in America. Many are spending over $7,200 out of pocket on caregiving expenses. And while these financial challenges affect everyone, the hardest hit are African-Americans, Hispanic Latinos, younger caregivers, and those caring for loved ones with dementia. So AARP wants to support family caregivers so they can safely care for their older loved ones at home, keeping them out of nursing homes and preventing unnecessary and costly hospitalizations. On aarp.org slash caregiving, you will find the Caregivers Resource Center which hosts lots of free caregiving resources. From our financial workbook, state resources guides, information for first time caregivers, caregiver support groups, and more. We also offer a free caregiving resource line, which is available to take calls Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. That number is 1-877-333-5885. The support line is also available in Spanish at 1-888-971-2013. And we will put those links and phone numbers in chat for you. You can also find them again on aarp.org slash caregiving. Being a family caregiver is one of the most important jobs you'll ever have and one of the most challenging. So download one of several free caregiving guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Now I'd like to kick off our event by introducing our moderator for this evening, Kenyatta D. Berry. Kenyatta is the author of the Family Tree Toolkit, and a contributor to the groundbreaking 1619 Project, published by the New York Times. Kenyatta is an author, attorney, lecturer, professional genealogist, and television personality. She was the 2019 Honorary Chair for Preservation Week and was named a newsmaker in American Libraries Magazine 
the American Library Association publication. Kenyatta's vast knowledge in African-American genealogy, enslaved ancestral research, and DNA have made her an invaluable resource. Kenyatta's work as a host on Genealogy Roadshow on PBS garnered over one and a half million viewers per episode and generated enormous buzz surrounding her insight, understanding, and expertise. Kenyatta was featured on The Real, revealing the DNA results of the host in a segment entitled, Who Am I? The videos of this segment have reached over 11 million views on YouTube. As demand grows for people to learn more about their lineage, Kenyatta continues to innovate, transforming the world of genealogy by making it more accessible to the masses. Welcome, Kenyatta. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to introduce um, Dr. Abbott. So I'm very excited for tonight's presentation. I think you guys will learn a lot, um, but let me kind of introduce you to her and her accolades. Deborah A. Abbott, PhD, is a professional genealogist specializing in genealogy methodology, manuscript collections. If you haven't heard her uh, lectures on manuscript collections, I highly recommend them, um, and African-American family research. She is a member of the Cuyahoga, excuse me, County Archives Commission, the Lakeview Cemetery Community Outreach Committee in Cleveland, Ohio, past president of the African American Genealogical Society, Cleveland, Ohio, and a retired professor of counseling from Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland. She holds a BS and a master's in education from Tuskegee University and a PhD from Kent State University. Dr. Abbott is a coordinator of both the African American track at the Institute of Genealogical and Historical Research, IGHR, in Athens, Georgia, which I've attended in very excellent course, and also the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh, GRIP. She teaches at SLIG, the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy, as well as the Texas Institute of Genealogical Research. Dr. Abbott has articles published in the Ohio Genealogy News and the Family Tree Magazine. She can be found teaching African-American genealogy in a segment entitled Needles and Threads on Ancestry Academy, an educational video course for Ancestry.com. She also teaches monthly classes entitled Using Ancestry.com and Genealogy Research at the Lakewood, Ohio Public Library and coordinates the Genealogy and Family History Clinic for the Cleveland Public Library. She's a member of NGS, the National Genealogical Society, APG, the Association of Professional Genealogy, and GSG, the Genealogical Speakers Guild. A Cleveland, Ohio native, Dr. Abbott is a life member of AKA, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, my sorority as well, um, the Tuskegee University National Alumni Association and Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland. And I'm excited to share this evening with Dr. Abbott to get started. Let me get ready to share my screen. Yes. Thank you, Kenyatta. Sure, let me get to my. Are you there? there? We go. Yep, we are there. All, All right. right. Take it away. Well, tonight we are going to talk about African American genealogy, and I look at it as a quilt. Think about our family and our lives and the things that we've had to go through. And then just to trace back to our ancestors. It's just like having different types of cloth and different types of thread and different colors. And you just don't know what it's gonna to take to get us back to where we want to be. Um, genealogy research, is a way for us to find our ancestors and to learn how they lived. We wanna know what their hardships were. We wanna know what they endured. We want to know the joys that they shared because once we can understand all of that, then we can truly appreciate our history. And as I've said before, and I've said this to Kenyatta a couple of times, 
it's because of what they all went through that allowed her to become the, an attorney and me to become an educator, a professor, a PhD. And so their sweat and pain was not in vain because we are here. And if we all can think like that, we're gonna be in pretty good shape. A lot of times people think that there are no records for African-Americans, that nobody kept records for us. But what you see on the screen right now are places where you may be able to find some of the information that you may need on your ancestor because we don't want to just talk about whose parent, who the parent is or the grandparent or the great grandparent. You want to know about their, their life. What was going on? What historical moments did they live through? And what things did they have to do in order to stay safe sometimes? And so you see on this screen, uh, there's a website called Digital Library on American Slavery. And it's going to tell you some things that people had to do with the legislature. So it's good to know the law when you are researching African Americans. Uh, Chronicling America, that's newspapers. And so if you don't have that as part of your research tools or your toolkit, then you're missing just a little bit of information. You need newspapers. I'm not going to go through everything that you see here. Uh, there are two things here that I'm sure you're familiar with. One is Ancestry.com because we see it on television all the time. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Family Search. And I use both of them usually at the same time, but we are probably fam more familiar with them than we might be a Fold, Fold 3 or Internet Archives or Born in Slavery, which is slave narratives from the Library of Congress. So let's just talk about how we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to just start with the basics, as I call it. We're going to interview our family members. We're going to record their oral histories. And, re and you're going to record the oral histories that you know as well. But keep in mind that the further away a person is from the event that they're talking about, the less likely it's going to be true. And so as a genealogist, it is our job not to throw away our oral history. We need to keep our oral history with us, but we need to make sure that we can prove what things are being told. And you may find that when you start to interview people that they are going to give you different versions probably of the same event. Hold on to both versions because there's gonna be something in there in each one that's gonna be true and link them together. We start out with our census records and you've taken the census. And I think we did it in Kenyatta, is it 19, I mean, 2020 was our last census? Yes. yes. 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the census is what we use and just keep in mind Census have been taken since 1790, every 10 years. And the census, of course, is not made for genealogists. They're made for federal government use, but the information that it contains is just so wonderful that it helps us find our ancestors. And just so that you know, the census is closed for 72 years. So the one that we did in 2020 will not be available to the public for 72 years. So the latest one we can look at right now is 1950, and they just released that on April 1st. Mm -hmm. So once you've done a lot of your census work, you want to gather your marriage and your uh, birth records and death records. You want to look at divorces, and you just literally want to become a detective. And then you need to think, as I call it, circularly, in a circle. Look at the people that's around you. Look at the people that your ancestors touched. And you will be surprised how much information you can find about your direct ancestor 
from other people. And then just create timelines so that you know where you are. And then just become a historian and read. You have to understand what's going on in the places where your ancestors live. And Dr. Abbott, I want to add here, just one of my biggest um, regrets is that my great-grandmother died at 104. And I did not interview her on my very side. And so I want anyone in the audience to make sure at the top, we talk about interviewing family members and definitely do that because that is my biggest brick wall. But I had the opportunity, but didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to do that. I would agree. Let's, let's just look at this 1940 census for just a moment. And this is so that you will know what kind of information you can find. Uh, this happens to be my grandfather. And I've put an arrow here, plus it's, it's color coded a little bit. This is what ancestry does, color codes who you're looking for. But here's my, my uh, grandfather. So you can see his name, but you also can see a little X with a circle around it uh, by his name. And this is the only census where they indicate who gave the information to the census taker. No other census tells you that. So we're kind of guessing a little bit of who may have given the information. But here you can see that he is the head of household. And if you read across with me, he's the head of household. He is 46 years old and he is married. He's born in South Carolina. He's got six children and they're all born in different places. He's got six children, two born in North Carolina, two born in Virginia and two born in Ohio. This 1940 census is Cleveland, Ohio. Now the places where his children are born gives us a migration pattern. Where has he lived? Where did he live before he came to Cleveland? North Carolina, Virginia, and Ohio. So two children for Ohio, two children in Virginia, two children in North Carolina. So that helps me track him backwards a little bit easier because of the birthplaces of his children. And then in 1935, and this is the very last column, it says same place. And what that means is that he lived in the county in 1935. He did not live in this house where he is in 1940. Okay, so that gives us, that gives us some information. All right. And then the census keeps going. So you can see down there underneath it, I made it a little bit yellow, so it would look a little different. It also is going to tell us his occupation. And if you look on that top line, hopefully you can make it out, he is a mechanic. And then it tells me that he works for auto, uh, auto shop. And mm -hmm. so again, it leads me to another record. If I look at a city directory, then I will probably be able to find out what the name of that auto shop is where my grandfather is working. And it's telling me that he worked private, uh, a private business, and that was PW. And then I don't know if you can see, I think it's one, two, three people down, I think you should be able to see there's one person there that has GW, and that means government work. And that is one of my uncles, and he is working for the NYA, the National Youth Association, which was a part of the WPA with President Roosevelt. And those records are at the National Archives. So I can get those records and probably find out what my uncle was doing as a young person working for the NYA. And then it tells us how many weeks that they worked and how much money they made. So the type of money we talk, think about now is nowhere near what we see in 1940.
All right, let's go. Let's just look at 1910 quickly. So the census, when we're researching, we would start really with 1950 and work our way backwards and compare the information. So we would do 1950, 40, 30, 20, and then 10. Now, this is another person in 1910. This is not my grandfather. But what I'd like about the 1910 census it th is that it tells us, and if you look where I've got the little um, ring there, this lady has had seven children and only two are living. And sometimes in our oral history, you may never even have heard of those seven children, but mm -hmm. you can find those children by paying attention to the census that come before 1910. You probably can find the names or you can check the vital records, the death records and see if you see death records for children who would have been born to George, Georgia and Briscoe. So this again tells us she's had a household. She's a widow. I would be looking for her husband. She's got her son who lives there and he has been married two times. So I would be looking for his other wife. And, he, and there are seven, um, I just said seven children she has and two living, and she was born in Kentucky. Underneath is the other part of the census. She owns a farm. She works for herself. She doesn't have a mortgage, but it also tells us at the very end that we can find out what she is growing on a farm schedule, number 49. I, I really do like this death, this death certificate. And this is what I call modern day. This is 1945. This is Alvira Gilchrist. And there wasn't much that the family knew about her and they wanted to try and go back into slavery. And so we have uh, Alvira Gilchrist's death certificate. And just keep in mind, that the death certificates or any of the vital records are going to be held in the place where the event happened. So mm -hmm. she dies in um, North Carolina, Davidson County. And the information on here tells us one thing was who her father is. And her father is Limus Dusenberry. And that takes us back into slavery, because if you look at um, the age of Alvira in 1945, they say on the death certificate, she's around 72. So she's not in slavery, but her parents would be. And so mm -hmm. I do what I would have a name, Limus, to start trying to look for that name in slave records. And you also can see where she was um, born. We see where she lives, where she was born, uh, where her burial is, the cemetery, and what the funeral home is. And one of my pet peeves is always to research the funeral home to see what the history is of the funeral home. Which they have good, some funeral homes have great records, but also the big thing here is with death certificates, it's only as good as the informant. That's right? correct. The person providing the information. So that'd be James B. Gilchrist Jr. Yes. Right. Based yes. on what he knows at her time of death, that's the information that we're going to get that leads us down the path to find more. And, and as I use the census records for Elvira, I find out that James B. Gilchrist Jr. is her grandson. Mm. So he's given information that's going to be oral, oral history. Mm -hmm. And we just got to prove it and make sure it's right. Right. Here's a, here's a wonderful uh, death announcement that was in the paper. And again, this is modern times, 1952. And this is Martha Collins Dillingham. And this newspaper announcement says that she was 105. 
Well, I'm one of those people who I don't believe everything I read, nor do I believe everything I hear. So she's 105. So I checked the census records to see if she actually would have been 105. And so here I'm just showing you the index, not the actual census, but this is the index to the census. And in 1870, Martha Collins is five years old. That would tell you she's probably, probably born around 1865. So she may have been born into slavery, but at the very tail end of it. So it's not like she was a slave because she's born in 65. And I checked the 1880 census and she's 16. So her age stays steady. And she was, her age stayed the same all the way through 1950. And so this 105 age in the paper is oral history and is not quite correct. But the good thing about this one is that it tells us that they found a family Bible and, it, and the family Bible said May 1847 was her birth. Somebody wrote that from oral history. I'm certain. I looked for that Bible, so I don't know where it is. But if they say 1847, then okay. But I don't see her to 1870. So mm -hmm. it's not quite right. But it did tell us that her parents were slaves. It did tell us who the first enslaver was, Rich, Richard Mundy. And then they were sold to a Jewel Collins. And that might account for Martha's maiden name being Collins. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I did find that, took a little while, but we eventually found those two enslavers. So Dr. Abbott, just real quick, why is it important to know the last enslaver or previous enslavers? Well, prior to uh, 1865, if your ancestors are enslaved, then we're only, we're, we're looking at, and I hate to say this, but it's property. And mm -hmm. so we have to change how we think and stop looking for people and start looking for property. And the only way to do that is try to find the person who owns the property. So mm -hmm. the enslaver, if I research the enslaver's family as if it was my own, then I'm going to find documents. I'm going to find, and it may be even business documents, but I'm going to find documents that may list my ancestor. And, it, and in this case, it did list the parents in some of those records, the parents of Martha Collins Dillingham. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it's important. So I didn't have to do a, a lot of searching and trying to figure out who the slaveholder was because it was in this newspaper article. And when I looked for them, there they were. This one, uh, this is a, a person that belongs to um, uh, Alvira because you see that Dusenberry name, but this person comes from the generation of her father. But I wanted you to see this because it shows how we change, we may change our name and we change our names at will. Nobody's changing them for us, sometimes we do. So here is a Peter Norcom. That was his name when he was freed at the end of the Civil War in 1865. He's in uh, Cataract County, North Carolina. Then in 1867, he is listed on the voter registration um, records. And the voter registration records were created as a result of the Reconstruction Act that was passed in the US Congress in March of 1867. And it was for the states, the rebel states, as they call them, the states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. And it was the registration of all male uh, citizens, 
21 years and older in each county who had taken the loyalty oath to the United States. And so Peter Norcom is freed in Cataract, Cataract, excuse me, County. And in 1867, he's listed his name as Peter Dusenberry. In 1870 census, I find him as Peter Norcom. And in 1880, he has gone back to Dusenberry and he stays that way until he dies. He is Dusenberry. Now, in this particular case, the reason is that he belonged to the Dusenberries first, and then he was given to the Norcoms. Mm -hmm. So when slavery came, he was freed from the Norcom family. And then he so just went back and forth. Yes. For someone who has this, may encounter this, how do you know it's your same person, right? How did you know it was your, this Peter was the right Peter? Like, because I looked at ages, I looked mm -hmm. at the wills of the enslaver. I looked mm -hmm. at the wills of, of um, the Norcom family. And I looked at the will of the Dusenberry family. And mm -hmm. the Dusenberry family, they um, divided their slaves up and some of them moved away. Because if you remember, uh, Alvira is staying in Davison County, but mm -hmm. this is in Cataract County. And it's because Samuel Dusenberry gave Peter to his daughter and she was married to a Norcom and then they moved away. Mm -hmm. So okay. just paying attention to the census and paying attention to the records that belong to the enslaver help me to realize I am looking at the right person. It's okay. not easy. <laughs> no, it's not it's a detective work, as you said. Yes, it's a detective. This is 1870. And I wanted to share this with you because this is my own family trying to find the enslaver. So you can see to the, I think that's the left. Is that the left, Kenyatta? Where? Um, yes. Okay. Yes, the, what I do in 1870, and I would suggest this to everybody, is that once you get to 1870, if your ancestor was enslaved, this is the first time they're going to show up on a census record. And so I just try to survey the entire county. So once I find my ancestor, then I look to see who else is in the county, African-American, who might carry the last name of, of my ancestor. In this case, it's Lipscomb. And I also look to see where the people are born. Where did they come from? This is Caswell County, North Carolina. And you can see on the right that the, the African-Americans there, and my ancestor is in that color-coded section, they're all born in Virginia, except for Reuben. He started out saying Virginia, but then they crossed it out and said North Carolina. So we really don't know. But after I checked to see who is there, and in this case, I think I had about 75 African Americans that were um, born in Virginia, heads of households born in Virginia. But there were probably 75 or more African Americans in that county, heads of household. I looked to see who's, who white might be there with my last name, and there was no one. But the person closest to them is to your left, and that is Gilly and Bigger, or Bigger and Gilly Powell. And you can tell how much land they have, which is a lot, looks like about $1,300 worth of real estate and $8,000 worth of personal property. That tells me that they probably own some slaves in, in the years prior to 1870. But they're also born in Virginia. And all of them are on this census. So mm -hmm. I don't know who Gilly Powell is or Biggers, but they may be the slaveholder 
to my family. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep looking. I don't know very much about <coughs> Caswell County, North Carolina. And so what I did was try to um, learn something about Caswell. And so here's a book that I used, one of the books that I used to learn the history of Caswell County. My, um, the, everybody that we looked at in 1870 is born in Virginia. So I need a map. And I think I, hopefully you can see this little tiny map that I have in here. I pulled a map and you can see Caswell County. And then up above it, there were two Virginia counties that crossed Caswell. And mm -hmm. so I took a chance. I took both of those counties. And you know, if we're looking for property, then <clears throat> the persons that probably would be the enslaver are paying taxes on their property, which includes the slaves. And so I went into the tax list for both of those counties. And I started out looking for somebody last name Lipscomb, found a lot of them, put them in alphabetical order, and somebody's paying, paying attention to me and watching over me. And the very first one that I came across was in Halifax County. So I had to start to read about Halifax County so that I can make sure I understand Halifax and Caswell County, North Carolina and Halifax County, Virginia. And so that I can make sure that I'm following the records when I follow the person who is in Halifax. And I think it's important here for everyone that's on the webinar to understand and knowing the history of the county and neighboring counties mm -hmm. is because your family moved back and forth. Yes. And I found even with my, oh, my third great grandfather, he was in the history of Culpeper <laughs> County book around because he was a trustee for a church. I wouldn't have known that had I not even just looked in that book. So I think it's important to understand the history of the county, to know the neighboring counties, to know the state you're researching in and understand the laws, which I think we're about to get into right now, Dr. Abbott. Yes, yes. So the laws are important. So once I identified someone in that tax list that I made, I followed that person until he died. And this is where I talk about you looking for your ancestor in the records of the enslaver. So the first person was Clement Lipscomb and he dies in 1849, he's in Halifax. But here's his will, a part of his will. He leaves everything he has to his wife, Sally B. Lipscomb. And then he says he leaves her everything, his estate, real estate, and his personal property in both Virginia and North Carolina. I almost had a stroke. <laughs> I thought, first time out, and I think I got him. I think this is who I want. And so if he has property in both places, I need to check and see if his will is filed in uh, Caswell County. And see, before this, I would not have known to look for him in Caswell County. Mm -hmm. So now I go back to Caswell County courts and I do find this will. And I find his will, I find his inventory and his appraisal. So here's the inventory of Clement Lipscomb, Caswell County. This is January, 1850. And it lists the names of his slaves that he owns in Caswell County, North Carolina. And I put in red those um, slaves that I remember seeing on that 1870 census. So as you can see here, there's Jacob, there's Reuben, and there's George, who is my family. 
And then at the bottom of George's family, the last person is Allie. And if you remember just, just a few seconds ago, it told us that Allie had a burnt hand. So I have all four of the people that, that are on that census in 1870. Now, I need to follow the, the wife because he gives everything to her. Mm -hmm. So I need to follow her to see what happens to my own people. But lucky or unlucky, she doesn't die to 1869. So slavery is over. Mm -hmm. But that's not a reason not to look at her records. So her estate is still there. I pull the estate and there are these same people plus others who are working for her in 1869. Mm. They are growing tobacco in 1869. And there's records showing how much she paid, how much they're paying these individuals. And it also tells me that they bought things from her estate. So you get all kinds of information about your ancestor by looking at the enslavers' records. Mm -hmm. And, and oh, sorry. No, um, I was going to say, and, and because of that, I found out too that Biggers Powell that we saw, mm -hmm. and Gilly Powell. Gilly is Clement's daughter. Mm. And so when they divided up the land, Gilly Powell got the land where Reuben and Jacob and George and Allie lived. Mm. She was his daughter. And I think it's important to note here as well, when you're doing this type of research that you may find information with your ancestors uh, with value attached to them or uh, in, in an inventory. Yes. Yes. And, and that can be heartbreaking, right? I mean, it, it's definitely difficult. So you never know what you're going to find when you're doing this research, but it's really important to do it because that's how you find your family and you reunite these families torn apart uh, due to slavery. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of somehow, I don't know, prepare yourself for that in some way. Um, but know that all of these folks that we're talking about want to be family, right? Yes, and I agree. They want their story to be told. Yes, I agree. I thought I'd share with you this manifest of slaves. These, these are, are people that they're bringing on, on ships. Now, again, we talk about the law and understanding what's going on. And I know that all of us know that the Civil War ended slavery, 1865. But the United States stopped the, I'm calling it the uh, um, transatlantic slave trade in 1808. And so it was illegal to bring uh, slaves from other countries into the United States, but it was not illegal for them to transport them across United States uh, property, across the land. And so this is a manifest of what they call domestic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And this uh, one, I, if I'm not mistaken, is going from uh, Texas to, is it going from Texas to Louisiana? I think that's mm -hmm. where it's going. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going from Texas to Louisiana. And so these, the domestic ones, the individuals probably have names to them. The transatlantic uh, manifest will not have any names. But mm -hmm. the uh, domestic manifest will have names. And so you have names of the people, you have their sex, their age, you're going to have their height sometimes. Uh, you can be able to tell if there's children on this, on this ship. And so it's going from, um, yeah, I think it's going from, from Texas to Louisiana. Does that make sense? Or am I going in the wrong direction? No, I think you, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. going from, and the, the shipper is um, from Texas and he and the person who is over the ship 
have to sign a document that says that these individuals are domestic slaves, not slaves that are coming from outside of the country. And they have to sign a form for that. These records uh, for the domestic slave trade are at the National Archives. So again, the law becomes very important and we have to realize that uh, there were black codes and slave laws in all of the 13 colonies in the beginning and in Northern states as well. And so <clears throat> slavery was different everywhere. Everywhere we, we research slavery will be different. And so it's important that you read about the areas and it's important that you learn the laws and to understand that slavery was a permanent condition, okay? Nobody grew out of it. Nobody could get out of it without permission from the um, enslaver. And then all of the slave codes or laws had sections in them that regulated free Blacks. I live in Ohio. This is a free state. It was a free state, first state to come out of the Northwest Territory. And in the Northwest Territory, slavery was forbidden. But Ohio patterned its first constitution after the state of Virginia. So there was a lot about it that reflected what I thought was slave uh, information. And so you can see here in 1804, they had limits on what African-Americans could do in the state of Ohio. Again, you're still looking at a free state that does not have slavery, but there are laws that govern what these individuals can do. They had to pay a bond, 12 and a half cents per person who came into the state of Ohio. They had to prove that they were not runaways and that they had been uh, manumitted or born free. They couldn't hold public office. They couldn't testify in court. They couldn't join the militia and they weren't allowed to be admitted in any of the state poorhouses, insane asylums or anything like that. This is the state of Ohio. In 1807, they made it just a little bit harder because they would have to put up a $500 bond and have two white people to vouch for them. So again, the, this creates a lot of records that we could possibly find in the courthouses of the free uh, states and the states that came out the Northwest Territory, of course, are states like Illinois, Indiana, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, places like that. And um, then don't forget your, your colonies. And um, we just, well, we didn't just find it, but in Pennsylvania, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there were, um, some records, some ledgers that they found in the basement. And so now those are available for you to research. And then again, to help you to know the laws, are a few books, and I just have three of them here. Uh, Slavery and the Law by Paul Finkelman. Um, if your ancestors were free and in North Carolina, this is a good one by John Hope Franklin. And then Slave Genealogy, which is a research guide and how to trace slave ancestors. A lot of our ancestors may have been in the, in the war, in the Civil War. And when they did that, they had run away from their, from their enslaver. This is Elijah Alford. He was a part of the 116th Regiment, Company H. Um, he enlisted at Camp Nelson in Kentucky. But what's so good about this particular service record is that it, it tells us he, how old Elijah was. It tells us when he enlisted. It tells us uh, how long he was gonna be there, which was three years. Tells us his eyes is black, his hair is black, and his complexion is black. He is five foot six inches tall. It also tells us that he was 
coming from uh, Garrett County, Kentucky, and then where you see this, the, the circle that I have there, it tells you who his slaveholder was. It says owner's name, Samuel Aldridge. Again, this is just a, for you to understand that every slave individual did not take the last name of their enslaver. So this is Elijah Alford and his enslaver is Samuel Aldridge. All right, that service record led me to the civil, his Civil War pension file. Let's see if he asked for a pension, which he did. Again, these records are at the National. Oh, sorry. That's okay, go back. <laughs> That's, that was trying to get, there we go, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> to the National Archives. And um, so I learned a little bit about Elijah because I had been tracing him through the census. And in the 1870 census, he was listed there by name only, initials, not his name, but by his, his initials. And so here was Elijah Alford, and then it had his wife was L. Alford. And so I tried to find a marriage record, which I did, and I found that he was um, married to a Lucy Rhodes. But when I found this record, it said that he had a wife after Lucy Rhodes, and her name was Louisa Bowler. And so it, it gave me information that I probably wouldn't ordinarily have. Plus it told me when Louisa Bowler died, 1897. So when I find Elijah in 1900, he is a widow. This answers that question. Again, just looking at this as a deed of emancipation. This is Benjamin Prowl, and he is uh, freeing Gabriella and her children, Harriet and James. This is Mercer County, Kentucky. This is 1841. And so this is what the emancipation looks like. And you can see that you're going to have to learn how to read all kinds of script in order for you to figure out uh, what's going on. But this is the deed of emancipation from Benjamin Prowl to Gabriella, and of course, I find her in the census. This is 1841. I find her in the census in 1850, free with a husband and her children, Harriet and James. Oh, that's so you can read it better. <laughs> and, and you can see uh, what he says. He also tells us how old Her uh, Gabriella is, and he tells us how old her children are as well. And then Benjamin Prowl again, he gives permission to one of his slaves to marry. And this is 1833. And so again, you can see that he has given permission um, for Marianne Prowl, who happens to be Gabriella's sister, to marry Camillus Rowe. And then in researching that Rowe family, I found Benjamin Prowl's uh, Benjamin Prowl's um, Bible. They had it in their family. So here you can see what his consent was to marry, to allow Marianne to marry. So this is what is listed in that document. He um, gives the consent for the marriage between Cam Rowe and Marianne, a colored girl of his and he authorizes that they can issue a license. And he does that in 1833. And then I know you've heard of the Freedmen's Bureau records and they did a lot of things. They legalized the marriages. They also um, did school records. They also uh, helped people find their lost uh, family members. And they also did labor contracts because a lot of the slaves didn't leave the enslaver. And so once they decided to stay there, 
they're not in a slave situation. So they need a contract that says how much work they are going to do or how much they're going to get paid. But I thought I'd share with you this legalized marriage that the Freedmen's Bureau did in Tennessee. And this is 1866. So not only do we have the name of the mother and the father or the husband and the wife, we also have that they've been married for 15 years already in 1866. And then it lists the names of all their children and their birth dates. Mm -hmm. And the Freedmen's Bureau records are really good. Um, they're available on Family Search and Ancestry. And I found a labor contract for my fourth great grandfather, uh, Louis Carter, in Madison County, Virginia, which led me to his last enslaver. So I think the labor contracts are really good to kind of give you a clue to who the mm -hmm. last enslaver is. Yes. Um, if you don't necessarily have a marriage record like this, but a labor contract uh, definitely helps. And it also tells you. For him, it was like half of the, um, it was sharecropping. So half of the shares or half of the crops for the year. And the date of the contract was January 8th, 1866. So that's good information for me to have to lead me on the path to find my Yes, yes, yes. All right, and this last record is the Freedmen's Bank. And it's different from the Freedmen's Bureau. But I did want you to look at what kind of information you can find on a Freedman's bank um, register. And so again, these records are online. I think Family Search has them. Yeah, Family Search has them online. And so this person is Abraham Baker. You can see that his enslaver is Johnson Dorsey. So they don't have the same last name. He's from Washington County, Kentucky. And you can see that he has a child and the child is Ben Cooper. So here we've got three people with three different surnames. And so these records do help us a lot. Uh, Abraham Baker is in the uh, military and you can see where this regiment is. He's included that and mm -hmm. telling you, um, so you know where he is and that four, you can go back and do as we did with Elijah Alfred and probably get some additional information. It also tells us that he has a scar um, on the left, his left leg and that it was done by an ax. Mm -hmm. And then here is Eli, Elijah uh, Rankin and almost the same, but it doesn't tell me about an enslaver, but it does uh, tell me his names of all of his children. And it tells me the name of his father, who at this time is deceased and the name of his mother. But he says they are all, his brothers and sisters are all dead. And then mm -hmm. he has a note that says his children can draw money from his account. So here we are at the end. We've done the best we could. And this is our sewing basket. So this is resources, Civil War Register of Claims, Southern Claims Commission, Congressional Records, uh, a website called Documenting the American South. These are things that we did not go over tonight. Uh, Digital Library on American Slavery, Mapping the Freedmen's Bureau, which will help you with the Freedmen's Bureau locations, records of antebellum Southern plantation records. You need to check your libraries and archives for that. Library of Congress, which has the slave narratives, the National Archives, and the Ancestry.com uh, Family Search World Catalog is where you can get books. Archive Grid and Internet Archives can help you with manuscript collections. And then the records that you use for slave ancestry, court records, wills, probate, settlements and estates, taxes, land deeds, manumissions, cemetery records, your vital records, manuscript collections, ship manifests, slave deeds, newspapers, Bibles, slave births, uh, military service and pension records. And Virginia has a lot of slave births. I have to have to mention that. Uh, yes. And then these are just to review some of the some of the necessary steps. Go mm -hmm. back to the basics, interview your family, exhaust the census records from 1950 all the way back to 1870. 
pay attention to the names. Research the collateral and cluster lines. That's my doing your circular genealogy. Read the newspapers. Uh, you got to research both black and white families. Obtain all the vital records, deeds, wills, and inventories that you can find. Familiarize yourself with the ancestral location. Read the history. Understand the laws. Become that historian and use maps. All right. Well, great. I don't know if we have enough time for questions, but um, I don't know if Nicole will jump back on and uh, kind of give us some last minute uh, announcements, I think, um, from ARP. She says they, if they're willing to stay on, oh, we'll do okay. 10 minutes. Oh, OK, great. Well, let me... If they have questions, I'll, we can, you, you and I together can try to answer them. <laughs> oh, OK. All right, so then I'll start with the first one is the 1890 census records were destroyed in a fire. Are there any other records that can be used to search for 1890 census data? Yes, uh, first of all, you need to, to make sure, and I think in 1880, it, one of the questions on that census asked if the person has served in the military mm -hmm. and if they've served in the Civil War. And if they have, you may be able to find them in that 1890 veteran schedule. Widows is veteran widows, and I forget it's something else, but that does exist. But other than that, the city directories is what I use. And city directories mm -hmm. are, are printed every year. And I just go through them and see if my person is there and just keep going through them until they disappear. But you want to try and look at city directories and you're going to find um, the city direct, you will find the city directories um, mm -hmm. in libraries and in archives and things like that. It's, it's the precursor to the phone book. If, you, yes. if you're familiar with the telephone book, that's what the city directory is. And it gives all kinds of information. So you can use city directories um for that and i'm trying to think what else what do you use kenyatta do you well think city about that? Directory, newspapers i newspapers, mean newspapers yes newspapers would be would be a good one um for sure uh to kind of fill in that gap of that timeline because you have a 20 year gap there yes. so um but one other question is where do you get wills so and this is from candy slaughter so wills are going to be available in courthouses so one of the resources that dr abbott talked about and that i like as well is um familysearch.org will tell you what records are available in the courthouses if the courthouse is burned and that's the best place to start for whichever county you're researching right so that's where you would get your wills i um, i would I would suggest that um, for family search, if you go into the family search and you click on the wiki tab, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, it's the, the wiki tab is what's going to give you a listing of, of places where you can research. I call it the research guide. So if you don't know anything at all about where your ancestor may have lived, you want to go into the family search wiki you want to put in, uh, in that wiki, you want to put in, you might want to put in your county first and get the list for your county, the records that are available for your county, and then go back and do the state because those records are going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And one other question we have is beyond the enslavers will or property records, are there any other records available to find enslaved persons other than 1850 or 1860 slave indexes? Well, the 1850 and the 1860 are slave schedules. I think that's what they're talking about. Right. Is, yeah. the, is the slave schedule. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that they're not real usable unless you know who the slaveholder is. Right. Exactly. If you don't know who the enslaver is, then it's not going to be real easy for you to use the 1850 and 60 um, slave schedule. But mm -hmm. keep in mind that 1850, no, 1840 going backwards to 1790, they have the slaves listed on those census records. 
They're on the second page mm -hmm. of the census records. So you don't have them itemized like you do in 1850 and 60, but you do see the number of slaves that an individual has on the, on the regular census. And so, but again, this is where doing your regular census, your 1870 or 1880 census comes in handy because then if you know that's your person and you've decided that they belong to somebody, you can check that 1850 uh, slave schedule and see if they have anybody that would be around the age of your ancestor. There's no name there, but you might be able to tell whether or not they might have owned your ancestor. Right. And then I'm just gonna, there are a couple, I'm just gonna do a quick roundup of questions. Um, so there's one about do local churches keep records that could be used? Yes, you need to, to <laughs> contact, yeah, you need to contact those churches. Um, one about how much information is available online. There is a, I'll say there's a lot, but not everything. So there's a lot of information available online. However, the records that we're talking about, African-American genealogy often found in the courthouses and a lot of times not digitized and indexed and we have to go there ourselves. Um, another question around, is there a place where eager black amateur researchers are gathering to support one another and share resources. Dr. Abbott, is there a place where folks can go? I mean, I would think of Maggie, but that's the Institute, but I don't know. Um, I wouldn't send a, a beginner to an Institute. What I would do is have them uh, check. And I don't know if there's any one place where you might be able to, other than the libraries or the um, archives where, where you live to mm -hmm. see if there's a genealogy society. Mm -hmm. an African-American genealogy society that you may need to join or you may need to at least attend some meetings so that you can get some help. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't send them to an institute right away. That's advanced. That's true. That's, true. <laughs> Those, that's advanced records. That is true. So there are a lot of, lot of uh, compliments for your presentation, Dr. Abbott. And then there's a question, are your library workshops online? So nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I, uh, we didn't have them. We didn't have them at all during COVID uh, because of me. I refused to go in the library during COVID. I just did an in-person um, library clinic for Cleveland Public um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we 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 don't just do African American. Um, I coordinate the clinic, but the African American Genealogy Society of Cleveland uh, are the people who volunteer to help the uh, patrons. Mm -hmm. And because it is open to everyone, we are able to help everyone regardless of color, regardless of who they're looking for. Um, a lot of people come and their ancestors are Europeans, but we are able to help them. And we just did a clinic um, a couple of Saturdays ago for Cleveland Public Library that was really a very good success. Everybody had to wear a mask. If they were coming in there with me, <laughs> they had to have on a mask. But uh, we're starting to go out, but no, none. even before COVID, none of those clinics were online. And then I think this would be the last question. There was um, a, around, is there a fee associated with online um, research? And so familysearch.org is free. Ancestry.com, of course, has a uh, membership fee associated with it, a uh, subscription fee, as well as um, fold3newspapers.com, MyHeritage, and Find My Past, which are kind of like the top sites. All of those are subscription-based. So if you want to do research, um, in those sites you have to pay, but familysearch.org is free and their wiki is a valuable resource as Dr. Abbott mentioned. So, and you, and you wanna make sure you check your local libraries, even though you're, you're researching someplace else, you wanna check your local libraries because a lot of libraries, at least here in Ohio and in Cleveland, they have those subscription databases mm -hmm. that are free to people who have library cards. So you want to check that and make and see what they have 
so that you can use it. If your library had Ancestry.com, which is a subscription database, if they had it during COVID, it was free. Ancestry allowed you to use their database through the library for free. Mm -hmm. So you want to check your libraries, but keep in mind that, uh, as, as Kenyatta just said, the lot of what you need if you want to go back into the slavery time frame is not um, digitized. You have to be in those repositories or at least know what you're looking for and maybe somebody at the repository can help you. So I don't know what else to say. It's a fun, it's a fun hobby. It's it just is. not, it's just not an inexpensive hobby. That's true. That's true. And it takes a lot of time. It but takes a lot been, of time. It's been great. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbott. I I we've had a good group of folks stay online with us. And I'm excited. I think we got through a lot of information. Um, but I'll turn it over to Nicole to close us out. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Kenyatta and Dr. Abbott. Um, it was a stellar presentation. I uh, hope you can sense that from the comments that you perceived in the question and answer session. Um, so again, thank you so much for the wealth of information you provided. I wanna let everyone know that again, after today's session, you will receive an email asking you to complete our survey. Let us know about your experience and how we can do better. Also along with an opportunity to provide your address in order to receive a free copy of the Family Tree Toolkit, a comprehensive guide to uncovering your ancestry and researching genealogy by Kenyatta D. Berry and additional genealogy tips and resources. So Kenyatta and Dr. Abbott, again, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Your knowledge and experience on genealogy is very much appreciated. It's been a pleasure having you both. Uh, we will let you get back to researching your family history. <laughs> if you join today, it's clear that family is important to you. So you can find caregiving support and free downloadable caregiving guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Uh, there you will find tips, resources, support, and the AARP Caregiver Resource Center. Or you can call our resource line at one 333 5885. It's been a pleasure being with you this evening. Within the hour, you'll receive that survey. We look forward to your feedback. Thank you for joining us. This concludes our event. Thank you. Thank you.